On September 25, 1973, Carl and Dorothy Strasser got up early to utilize a day off from work to go fishing. They were getting up there in years and liked to use any opportunity they could to spend time together outdoors. They loaded up their gear and left Casper, Wyoming, headed to the Pathfinder Reservoir. Instead of taking Highway 220 straight down, they got off the highway in Alcova and took a scenic drive around Alcova Reservoir, which led out to Fremont Canyon. Not long before reaching their final destination, they had to cross over Fremont Canyon using an old 60-foot-long steel bridge. The bridge crosses over the canyon gorge, which is 220 feet above the river below. As the Strassers crossed the bridge, they spotted a young woman laying in the dirt just off of the bridge. She was waving her arms to get their attention. Carl stopped and ran to the woman who was covered in dirt and dried blood. She was wearing a bright red sweatshirt, but was nude from the waist down. Dorothy grabbed a blanket from the trunk and wrapped it around the young woman. She told them that her legs wouldn't work, so they carried her into their car and turned the heater up full blast. It was near freezing temperatures in the canyon, and the woman had been there for hours. She told the couple that she had been raped, and both her and her sister were thrown off the bridge. My sister's down there, she said. I think she's dead. This is Monsters. As some of you know, I recently moved, and while we were in the planning stages, my older son asked me if we could move somewhere where there weren't any kidnappings. He had seen something online about kidnappings, and he had the brilliant idea that we should make sure we live somewhere where people don't get kidnapped. A great idea on paper, but I had to sit him down and have a conversation with him about kidnappings and crime in general. I had to break the news to him that kidnappings can happen anywhere, but I was able to inform him that they are increasingly rare. There are a lot of people who I've talked to who believe, at least here in the United States, that the crime rate is through the roof and that children are being kidnapped all the time, but that's simply not true. The crime rate in the U.S. peaked in 1991 and then began to steadily decline. In 2014, it reached its lowest point, being nearly half of what it was in the 90s. Since then, the crime rate has increased slightly, but not nearly to the level it was in 91. Kidnappings are also much rarer now than they were 30 years ago, but the ones that do happen are largely misunderstood. What most people fear is stranger abductions, someone who kidnaps a random child who wasn't previously known to them. These are the most rare types of kidnappings, and though they do happen, they don't happen at the frequency many people believe. The problem is that the increase in access to these stories has made it seem like the frequency has gone up, but they haven't. It's our ability to hear about the stories that have gone up. When I was a kid in the 80s, I would never hear about a kidnapping that happened outside of my area unless there was a reason for it to be famous. So there may have been a thousand kidnappings in the United States, but I would only hear about a couple of them. Today, not only does every kidnapping get reported on social media, but also anyone who's gone missing, which doesn't necessarily mean they were kidnapped. Today, there might be 500 kidnappings in the United States, and we hear about a hundred of them. Plus, all of the missing persons reports, which makes it feel like kidnappings are through the roof. But they aren't. And I just made those numbers up as an example. Most people who go missing are found within 24 hours. Children who are kidnapped are overwhelmingly taken by a parent or guardian, many of which stem from custody disputes. The chance that a stranger will kidnap a child is pretty slim. Now, I'm not saying anyone should stop being careful to protect their children from kidnapping, or that anyone should not post about a missing person on social media. It's a very useful tool in helping find missing and endangered people of any age. I just hate to see people, especially my own son, living in fear of something that's not likely to happen. The number one cause of death for children in the U.S. is motor vehicle accidents. The number two cause of death for children is firearm-related injury. Death from child abduction isn't even in the top 10, and only three of the top 10 leading causes of child death are things we can't control, which includes cancer, congenital defects, and respiratory failure. The rest of the list contains things that we do every day without a second thought. 
I've heard of people not allowing their children to walk to school because they fear they might get kidnapped, so they drive them, which is actually far more dangerous for a child. So despite me being part of the problem that I previously mentioned, telling stories of children being kidnapped and killed, it's still very unlikely that it will happen. I told my son to always be careful and not to accept a stranger's offer of candy or the ability to play with puppies or kittens, but at the end of the day, I want him to feel safe and spend his time being a kid, not worrying about being kidnapped. I've tried to teach him to be safe, but not to live in fear. Jerry Jenkins was born on December 7, 1943 and grew up in Casper, Wyoming. He was the oldest of four children born to Edgar and Dorothy Jenkins, though they had a fifth child who died at birth. Edgar was a hard-nosed World War II vet and truck driver who spent much of his time away from home. When he returned, he wanted order, but rarely got it, so he turned to physical abuse of his wife and children. All of the Jenkins children took to drugs and alcohol at a young age, and none of them did well in school. Jerry had a handful of low-paying jobs, but by the end of high school, his true career path was crime. He stole cars and property with other local youths. He had been arrested nine times before his 18th birthday. He served two terms in the Wyoming Boys School in Warland. He turned 18 during his second stint and he told the Board of Pardons that he wanted to join the Army. They believed him, so they had him tested and sent a notice to the local recruiter to expect Jerry in his office. As soon as Jerry was released, he bailed on the recruiter. Two months later, he was arrested for auto burglary after being caught stealing fuel from a car's gas tank. When he was arraigned, he was sent before Justice of the Peace Alice Burridge, who had recently celebrated the birth of a new granddaughter, Amy. Jerry was sent to Wyoming State Penitentiary, which back then was at 6th and Walnut in Rawlins. In 1980, a new Wyoming State Penitentiary was opened about 3 miles or 4.8 kilometers south of the original, and the old prison was turned into a museum called the Wyoming Frontier Prison Museum. Jerry was sentenced to a year, but after a failed escape attempt, he spent almost two years in solitary confinement before he was released. He was arrested again two months later. Before he went to court, Jerry's parole officer reported that he did not respond to supervision and would likely end up doing a life sentence on an installment plan, basically saying he would spend the rest of his life in and out of prison. Jerry earned his high school diploma during this stint and was paroled after serving about a year. People tend to gravitate toward their own kind, birds of a feather and all, so it wasn't surprising that Jerry became good friends with another local troublemaker named James Kennedy, who went by Jim. In the summer of 1968, Jerry and Jim convinced a young woman to get in their car, telling her they could go to a local diner and hang out. Instead, they took her to a secluded area and raped her. Then, they dumped her behind an apartment building in town and threatened to kill her if she told anyone about the attack. Well, she reported them to the police anyway, and both men were arrested. They had separate trials, and after testifying against Jim, where she was subjected to a brutal cross-examination from the defense, she decided she wouldn't testify again. Jim was convicted of first-degree rape and sent to prison, but without the victim's testimony, there wasn't enough evidence to convict Jerry and he walked. From then on, Jerry filled the hole left by Jim with his younger brother, Ron. Ronald Kennedy was born on July 17, 1946, the fourth child of Ernest and Hilda Kennedy. He was raised in a similar home as Jerry, though Ernest wasn't ex-military. He had worked for a short while as a mechanic, but eventually lived off of welfare due to crippling arthritis. He would spend his days drinking and getting into trouble. Hilda worked off and on as a dishwasher or a maid, usually having to leave the children home alone to take care of themselves. Ron was the fourth oldest of six children, and most of them had been in trouble with the law at a young age. It was Ron's older brother who went to prison for rape, and two of his sisters spent time at a girls' reform school. Ron didn't make it past eighth grade before dropping out. From there, he began a steady stream of arrests, some of which landed him in the same boys' school that Jerry had been in. After his brother Jim was sent to prison, he began a friendship with Jerry that would lead him down a path to more violent crime. The pair were arrested together after robbing a liquor store. Jerry had smashed the window and grabbed as many bottles of whiskey as he could, but fell as he ran away, smashing most of them on the ground. He also lost his glasses, which I think is hilarious. Both were arrested the following morning. Since it was Jerry's third felony, he ended up serving almost two years. 
This was Ron's first arrest as an adult, so he only served nine months. Ron would go on to break into an elderly woman's home, assault her, and steal $20. This was his first felony arrest, but Ron was no stranger to the inside of a prison. In 1971, 26-year-old Jerry met 16-year-old high school student Darcy and the two started dating. It wasn't long before Darcy was pregnant with their first daughter. By 1973, that daughter was one year old and they had a newborn daughter as well. The morning of September 24th, Jerry went to work at a gas station, a job he had only had for a couple of weeks, but he was already sick of it. He didn't like it there, but it wasn't the job. Jerry just didn't like working. Despite being pregnant for most of their relationship, Darcy was the one who brought in a steady income, though it was usually minimum wage. She had worked as a waitress and a nurse's aide. Jerry planned to take off work early so the family could all go pick up their newborn from the hospital. She had been diagnosed with encephalitis and had been in the hospital, but on that day, she was scheduled to be discharged. Jerry was supposed to come home at 1 p.m. so they could go to the hospital, but never showed up. At 2 p.m., Darcy called the gas station but was told that Jerry hadn't been to work in days. When a friend stopped by and told Darcy that they had spotted Jerry and Ron drinking at a pool hall at about 1 o'clock, Darcy knew it was time to leave her deadbeat husband. As soon as he returned with her car, she was taking the girls and moving to Colorado to be closer to her parents. Jerry had said that he was going to work that morning, but he really went straight to Ron's house. Well, Ron's mother's house. By this time, Ron had also gotten married, but, not surprisingly, also didn't really like working. He and his wife lived at his mother's house, and it's likely that his wife was the one who worked. It was Jerry's payday, so he wanted Ron to go into the gas station and tell his boss a lie about him being sick and grab his check. They spent hours at the pool hall drinking, and in the early afternoon, Ron went to the gas station. Though he successfully retrieved the paycheck, he told Jerry that Darcy had called the gas station and he was in trouble with his boss. Jerry didn't care. He knew Darcy would be mad, so he blew his paycheck on beer and they spent the rest of the day cruising around, drinking and looking for girls. After school on September 24th, 11-year-old Amy Burridge walked home from school and played catch with a friend for most of the evening. 18-year-old Rebecca Thompson, who went by Becky, was Amy's half-sister. At about 9 p.m., Becky was sent to the store by their mother and she asked Amy if she wanted to ride along. They asked Amy's friend, who lived across the street, but his mother said no. It was too late and it was a school night. Becky and Amy said bye and drove off together in Becky's white Ford station wagon. They pulled into the convenience store and purchased the items their mother had sent them for, but when they returned to the car, Becky noticed that she had a flat tire. That's when Jerry and Ron showed up and offered to help the girls. They pretended to start fixing the tire, but then Jerry said he didn't have the right tools so they offered them a ride. Amy went to the convenience store and called their mother to let her know that they had a flat tire, but that two nice men were going to give them a ride home. Becky and Amy were unaware that Ron had actually caused their flat tire. They had pulled into the parking lot at about the same time and saw the girls walk from their car into the store. Their mother, Tony, was expecting them back home within 30 minutes, but after 45 minutes passed without them showing up, she began to worry. She was already in her pajamas and ready for bed, so she put on her clothes and drove to the convenience store. She drove slowly and watched the sides of the roads just in case they were walking home. When she arrived at the store, she saw Becky's car in the parking lot with a flat tire, but there was no sign of the girls. After that, she just started driving up and down various roads between their house and the store, looking for any sign of her daughters. Becky and Amy weren't walking home. They were laying down in the back of Jerry's car as he drove around aimlessly for about three hours. Ron had started periodically beating and choking the girls. He told them that they had a friend who had been hit by a white Ford station wagon being driven by a couple of girls a few days prior. They had fled the scene and now their friend was paralyzed from the neck down. None of the story was true and it seemed they were simply getting pleasure out of scaring the sisters. They claimed that they were going to take them to their friend, and if he said it wasn't them, they would take them home. But if it was them, they were going to kill them. Amy told Ron that they had just returned from vacation, so it couldn't have been them. 
Ron just shrugged that off, and then he told Becky and Amy that he and Jerry were Hell's Angels, that they worked for the Mafia, and that they were Vietnam veterans. Jerry claimed that Ron had been shot in the head in Vietnam, and now he was, quote, more animal than man. They finally arrived at the Fremont Canyon Bridge, which was located in a very desolate area. Ron pulled Amy out of the car first, and the last thing Becky heard was her sister say, quote, I love you, Becky. Ron pushed the 11-year-old to the end of the bridge and threw her over. Amy fell 120 feet to the icy water below. Amy was too young for what Jerry and Ron wanted, so they disposed of her without a second thought. Becky was unaware that Amy had been thrown off the bridge. She was kept in the backseat of the car and told that Amy was only going into the house to talk to their paralyzed friend. With the younger sister out of the way, they took turns raping Becky. They let her put her jeans and sweatshirt back on, but not her underwear. Becky actually thanked them after they finished. She thanked them for not letting Amy see what they did to her. She had no idea that she was actually thanking them for killing her sister and not for shielding her from witnessing the rape. When they took Becky from the car, it was so dark outside that the canyon was barely visible. There was no moon out to light up the night sky. As they got to the railing, they told her she was going to see her sister. Then they grabbed her and tried to throw her over the rail, but Becky fought. The funny thing about sitting on your ass all day instead of working is that you don't really develop any strength. Becky had a firm grip on the rail and was doing a very good job of staying on the bridge. Ron put his hands around her neck and started to squeeze. Before she could be strangled to death and then thrown off the bridge, Becky decided it would be better to pretend to pass out and then be thrown off the bridge. At least she'd have a chance of surviving the fall. Amy had fallen 120 feet, all the way to some rocks on the edge of the river. Becky hit a rock ledge on her way down, which broke her pelvis, but also slowed her fall so when she hit the water, it didn't kill her. She realized immediately that her legs weren't working, so she doggy paddled over to the edge of the river and worked her way onto the shore. In the process of working her way up onto the rocks, her pants were pulled off, so she was wearing nothing but a soaked sweatshirt. She pulled some bushes over her to hide her body. The voices from above told her that the men were still there. They were looking down from the bridge above for any sign of movement. As the adrenaline wore off, the pain became more intense, but she made sure not to make a sound so her attackers wouldn't know where she was. She listened to every sound she heard down in the canyon. Coyotes, the river, the wind. But it wasn't until she heard the roar of an engine and saw headlights pulling away that she knew the men were leaving. At least for now. Was it a trick? Did one of them pull away so the other one could wait to see if she made noise? She didn't know, so she remained silent. For hours, she remained silent. By midnight, Tony had given up her search and called the police. The officers on duty that night were notified to keep an eye out for the girls, but an investigator wouldn't be on shift until 8 a.m. Tony called a friend to come over and spend the night with her as she stayed up worrying. She tried to sleep, but how can a parent sleep when their children are missing? In the morning, Becky gathered her strength and began working her way up the canyon wall. She went up backwards, pushing herself up little by little as her legs dangled in front of her. She would make it up the hill and then slide back down and have to work her way back up. It was two steps forward, one step back, for who knows how long, but eventually she made it to the top and laid by the road. Carl and Dorothy Strasser were on their way to do some fishing that morning when they found the beaten and bloodied young woman lying near the bridge. After getting her into the car, Carl went to the rail of the bridge and peered over, looking for any sign of Amy, but he didn't see anything. Without knowing the condition of Amy, he decided his priority was to get medical attention for Becky. She had severe wounds, one eye was swollen shut, the side of her head was purple, and she had lost the use of her legs. At a nearby store, Carl ran inside and called the sheriff's office. Sheriff Bill Estes arrived about 20 minutes later, followed by an ambulance. Sheriff Estes got as much information from Becky as he could and confirmed that she was one of the girls who had been reported missing. Then Becky was rushed to the hospital and the search was on for Amy. Casper Police Investigator Dave Davala arrived at Tony's house just after 8am and gathered as much information as he could. 
Their situation at home didn't make him immediately think the girls had run away. He found cash in one of their bedrooms, which they likely would have taken if they were leaving voluntarily. While out canvassing the area near the convenience store, Davala was informed that Becky had been found alive. He picked up Tony and together they went to the hospital where Becky hadn't arrived yet. They were in town, but the ambulance had a 30-minute drive in from the canyon. At the hospital, it was discovered that Becky's pelvis was broken in five places. She had a wide gash on her side and her left eye was swollen shut. Inside that swollen eye, doctors removed one contact lens, but the other one wasn't in her right eye. She told investigators that she and Amy had been taken by a short, fat man who she believed was named Jerry, and a tall, lanky man with bug eyes that said his name was Kenny, but she heard the other man call him Ronnie. The police instantly knew who they were. Jerry and Ron were no strangers to the law. Even so, they brought in a photo lineup and Becky easily identified the two. The river in the canyon was not fast moving, but it was cold and murky. Police had already searched the area outside. On the road near the bridge, they found a pair of black women's underwear, which had belonged to Becky. Floating in the water, they found two pink hair bows. A diver went into the river to search for Amy's body. First, he found a small white shoe sitting at the bottom of the river, and then a few feet away was Amy. She was face down, fully clothed beside missing the one shoe. X-rays would reveal that the left side of her ribcage was crushed and her spine had been pushed up into her brain. Shortly after recovering Amy's body, the diver, Fred Klein, left the search and rescue team. Amy was the last victim he would ever recover. Her grandmother, Justice of the Peace Alice Burridge, had passed away two years earlier, so she never had to find out that Jerry Jenkins would go on to murder her 11-year-old granddaughter. Ron Kennedy was arrested pretty quickly. He was at his mother's house and an officer picked him up and transported him to the police station. He was brought into Police Chief Robert Zippe's office and told that he was being charged with murder, rape, kidnapping, and assault. To which Ron replied, quote, How are you going to prove it? You've got no witnesses. After calling him a son of a bitch, one of the investigators informed him that one of his victims was still alive. Ron was fucked. Police had to do a little more hunting to find Jerry, but eventually he was also arrested. He was picked up while walking to a nearby liquor store, the same one he had robbed years before where he fell and lost his glasses. Talk about customer loyalty. In his interrogation, Jerry answered all of the investigators' questions. He said that Ron had slashed the tire on Becky's station wagon, and they were just going to help them change the tire so that Ron could have an opportunity to meet the older girl. In the interrogation, he referred to them as the older one and the younger one. He didn't even know their names. He claimed that his wrench didn't fit their lug nuts, so they offered them a ride home. In the car, Ron lost it and started beating on them. He admitted that they were trying to scare the girls and that they told them a story about a friend being paralyzed by a hit and run. He claimed that Ron took Amy out of the car, but he didn't know that he had thrown her off the bridge. When the investigator asked if the rape took place on the left or the right side of the road, he answered that it happened on the left. Realizing that he had just admitted to the rape, he refused to answer any more questions about that subject. He did, however, admit to helping Ron push Becky off the bridge. On their way back to town, they tossed Becky's purse and other belongings off a different bridge. Jerry said he wanted to turn himself in, but Ron convinced him not to. Jerry seemed genuinely remorseful, according to the investigator, and even said if the younger one was dead, he wanted the death penalty because he didn't think he could live with it. He said that he had never hurt anyone before, except that he had. He had raped a woman with Ron's older brother and only got away with it because she couldn't handle testifying again. Jerry knew exactly what he was doing that time, and he likely knew exactly what he was doing this time. When they got a warrant to search his car, they found blood spatter on the inside of one of the windows. The blood was a match for Becky. They also found a single contact lens on the floor of the white Impala. Even though they had their rapists and murderers in custody and one of them had confessed, the investigation continued in order to build the strongest case against them. They were being charged with a brand new first-degree murder charge in Wyoming. It was for any murder committed to conceal the identities or hide evidence of another crime. 
it came with the death penalty. Investigators found multiple women who had had encounters with both Jerry and Ron. They had pulled up next to a pair of high school students as they were walking home from school and talked to them for a few minutes before leaving. Another young woman was sitting in a park when Ron sat down next to her and tried talking to her despite her repeated requests for him to, quote, buzz off. When she got up, he grabbed her arm, but she told him she would punch him if he didn't let her go, and he did. The two predators circled the park in Jerry's car for a few minutes and then left. It definitely feels like escalating behavior. They were working their way up to kidnapping. One woman reported that she was running late to an event and was stopped by a construction crew when a short fat man in a green pickup pulled up next to her and told her he could show her a way around the construction. She began following him, but after going down a deserted dirt road in the wrong direction for a while, she changed her mind and turned around. Then she said the green pickup also turned around and raced to catch up with her, but when she turned onto the paved road, he sped away in the opposite direction. The description matched Jerry, and he did own an old green pickup at the time. She said there was no one else in the truck, so either he was acting alone or Ron was down that dirt road a ways waiting. Either way, Jerry would have been very aware of what he was doing, making me doubt even more his story that he didn't know what Ron was going to do on September 24th. Jerry and Ron's bail was set at $275,000 each, and news quickly began to spread that residents were working to raise the money so they could get the two out of jail, not because they supported either of them. By the evening of September 25th, they were the two most hated men in Casper, and possibly all of Wyoming. No, locals wanted to get them out of jail so they would be easier targets. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that the men were guilty and deserved the death penalty. They just didn't want to have to wait to get it. They wanted revenge, and they wanted it now. $275,000 is a lot of money now, let alone in a small Wyoming town in 1973. It would be close to $2 million apiece today, so they were never able to raise the money, and both Jerry and Ron remained in jail awaiting trial. Despite the positive identification from Becky and Jerry's confession, Ron maintained his innocence. He even convinced the undersheriff to talk to him about reducing his bail. Ron said that if he could get out, he would help them, quote, find out what sick motherfucker really did this. To Ron's delight, the undersheriff agreed. He said that he was friends with the judge and he could pull some strings. He told Ron that it would take a few days because he needed to put an ad in the paper first. An ad? Ron was confused. Why? The undersheriff told him that the whole city wanted to know exactly when he would be released from jail, and he needed to get some good odds on exactly how long he would last after his release. Ron was no longer delighted. The undersheriff had no intention of helping reduce his bail. Ron wasn't going anywhere. Becky was in the hospital for weeks, and even though Jerry and Ron were locked up fairly quickly, she never felt safe. She would wake up screaming, sure that they were going to come to the hospital and kill her. A nurse had to show her that there was an armed sheriff's deputy right outside the door to her hospital room at all times. Her pelvis healed slowly, but she was eventually able to leave the hospital and she gradually began walking again. Tony took her and her other sister to Mexico, where her stepfather was working just outside of Monterey. They would return to Casper periodically for the trial, but Mexico was supposed to be the place where Becky healed, away from the memories and the terror. The trial began on April 24, 1974, seven months after the crimes were committed. The prosecutor had a short opening statement. He summed up the case and the evidence. Then he told the jury that Becky didn't need their sympathy. She needed their attention and their understanding. For Amy's sake. Becky was the first witness, and she took the jury through the entire story. The flat tire, the car ride, the beatings, the rape, and the fall from the bridge. She couldn't describe Amy's death because she didn't see it happen. All she knew was that Amy was pulled from the car and she was never seen alive again. She identified Ronald Kennedy and Jerry Jenkins as her and Amy's attackers. She testified that they had given them fake names, but must have forgotten at some point because both of them called each other by their real names, Jerry and Ronnie. Ron's defense lawyer asked her a handful of questions about her statements that Ron was acting insane. It seemed that he might be working on an insanity defense, but both Ron and Jerry had been evaluated by psychiatrists, and it was determined that they knew right from wrong when they carried out their crime. 
that is the only thing that matters in a court of law when it comes to a defendant's mental health. Did they know what they were doing was wrong? If they did, then they weren't insane at the time of the crime. Now, of course, anyone who picks up an 11-year-old and throws her off a bridge to her death is not perfectly sane. These two were clearly psychopaths, but that's not the way insanity works in court. All that matters is that they knew what they were doing was wrong. Not only were these two evaluated, but one of the crimes they were charged with was a murder that they committed for the sole purpose of leaving no witnesses so they could get away with the kidnap and rape. They absolutely knew what they were doing was wrong. The rest of the trial consisted of a number of witness testimonies. Diver Fred Klein, Sheriff Bill Estes, the county coroner, and Dorothy Strasser, who found the broken young woman on the side of the road. The defense didn't ask any of them questions. The coroner's testimony was thoroughly horrifying. He described that Amy was in full rigor when he performed the autopsy. Her chest cavity was filled with clotted blood. Her aorta had exploded. Shards of four ribs had punctured one of her lungs. Then he showed an x-ray of Amy's spine pushed two inches up into her brain. The coroner explained that she had likely hit the rock ledge on the side of the river head first. He said that there were signs that she had not died instantly as she had inhaled some blood into her lungs, but he said that death would have come within seconds. The final nail in Jerry and Ron's coffin came from an optometrist who confirmed that the contact lens found in Jerry's car was identical to the one that had been taken out of Becky's eye at the hospital. This was not a case of mistaken identity. Becky was in that car and had suffered a beating that caused her to lose a contact lens. Since the prosecution chose to try Jerry and Ron together, they weren't able to use their statements during their interrogations. This meant that all of the incriminating statements that Jerry had made would not be heard by the jury, but the prosecutor felt that they had more than enough evidence to convict. Becky was a pretty strong witness, and having the attackers tried together meant that she would only have to testify once. Ron's lawyer tried to paint him as being insane, and Jerry's lawyer tried to make him out to be a follower, too dumb to come up with a plan to rape and murder. He was no use, though. Jerry and Ron were clearly guilty, and there was no excuse for their actions. The jury didn't take long to decide that both were guilty. At sentencing, when asked if they had anything to say, Ron spoke up and claimed that he used to believe in law and justice, but what he had just seen happen was a miscarriage of justice. Right. He was going to go to his grave pretending that he was not guilty of rape and murder. The judge didn't respond to his statement. He just sentenced them both to 13 years for the assault and 35 years for the rape of Becky Thompson and to death for the murder of Amy Burridge. He scheduled the executions to happen on September 25, 1974, the one-year anniversary of the crime. That death sentence would never come, though. Due to changes in death penalty laws, Jerry and Ron's death sentences were reversed, and though the murder convictions were upheld, they had to go back to court to be sentenced again without death as an option. This time, they were sentenced to life in prison to be served consecutively with their other sentences. That meant that they had to serve the minimum time for their rape and assault convictions before they would start serving their life sentence. Jerry Jenkins died of heart failure in 1998. He was 54 years old. He never even started his life sentence for the murder of Amy Burridge. Ronald Kennedy is still in prison in Wyoming. He began serving his life sentence in 2002, and though he does get a parole hearing every five years, he's unlikely to ever be released. He's currently 76 years old. This is not where the story ends, though. Becky may have survived the attack on September 24, 1973, but the people who were closest to her said she still died. The person who was Becky Thompson died at 18, but her body kept going through the motions. She lived a life of immense sadness at the loss of her sister and her own innocence. Her time in Mexico after she was released from the hospital didn't help her emotional or physical wounds at all. When she returned to Casper, she still feared that Jerry and Ron would get out of prison and come to kill her. She had planned on going to college before the attack, but she couldn't find the motivation now. She had some random jobs before she finally got into selling advertising. She enjoyed it, but her emotional issues were continuing to haunt her. She began drinking heavily along with taking antidepressants and smoking pot. Anything to ease the pain. 
She went to the doctor, and when the intake form asked why she wanted to be seen, she wrote, quote, I want to be normal again. Becky eventually became able to hide her inner turmoil. She made friends at the radio station where she worked and would leave friendly messages on her co-workers' desks. When Jerry and Ron were eligible for parole, the station put together a petition to keep them locked up and got more than 15,000 signatures. She was one of the top sellers in her advertising department. She was good with people and an outgoing person. When she met and married Russ Brown in 1987, people were beginning to believe that she was finally starting to heal. At the wedding, her father was stuck on an oil rig and couldn't attend the ceremony, so investigator Dave Davala ended up walking her down the aisle. Becky gave birth to a daughter in 1990, and the birth was difficult due to having her pelvis shattered years before, but she told people the pain was worth it. Becky's entire world revolved around the baby, which might have been a way to ignore the fact that her marriage was failing. Six months after the baby was born, Russ asked for a divorce, and Becky agreed. Now that she was a single mother, her income from the little radio station where she worked wasn't enough to make ends meet, so, despite her co-workers being like family to her, she quit her job and took a position at the biggest radio station in town. She would make more money, and they would provide health insurance for her and her daughter. The job had more benefits, but it came with a lot more pressure, and she had trouble meeting her sales quota. She also started worrying that her mental health issues would transfer to her daughter. By July 31, 1992, Becky had a boyfriend who she wasn't entirely happy with, and she wasn't able to kick her drug habit or her alcohol dependence. She believed that she was a failure in life and feared that her daughter would turn out just like her. On top of that, Jerry and Ron were petitioning for a new trial, and they had been denied that morning, but Becky hadn't got the news yet. She was still convinced that they would get out and come after her. She bought a six-pack of beer, and she and her boyfriend drove around aimlessly with her daughter in the back seat while they drank it. Suddenly, Becky announced that she wanted to go to the bridge. Her boyfriend objected, saying it wasn't a good idea, but she shrugged off his concern. They reached the bridge and Becky parked in a gravel lot on one side. She walked to the middle of the bridge and looked over the side. She told her boyfriend that that was where they threw her and Amy over. She pointed to a spot up the road and explained that that was where they raped her. Then she pointed to a rocky ledge and said that that was where she first hit before going into the water. She pointed out the spot in the bushes where she hid all night. She sat down on the bridge and started crying. Her boyfriend sat with her, holding the two-year-old in his arms, trying to comfort Becky. When the little girl started crying, Becky's boyfriend stood up to take her back to the car. Once the toddler was in the car, the boyfriend heard a splash, and when he turned around, Becky was gone. Dave Davala was now the sheriff of Natrona County, and he had a sinking feeling that he knew what happened when he got a call that a young woman had jumped from the Fremont Canyon Bridge. When he arrived on site, a rescue team was already there, working to retrieve the body. When he shined his flashlight down into the river, he could see Becky floating face down in the water. Becky may have survived 19 years prior, but what Jerry Jenkins and Ronald Kennedy did to her made it impossible for her to live. She was 37 years old. Jerry Jenkins and Ronald Kennedy were just bad people who thought the world owed them. They thought they could just take whatever they wanted and toss the evidence so they wouldn't get caught. The evidence, though, was human life. They just happened to be monsters that had no regard for that human life. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment.
You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.